there are some things that are natural about the passing of Colin Powell because he is both the culmination of every soldier who ever served, and I say soldier with the small s, a soldier, sailor, airman, marine that ever served. He is the culminating effect of all of them. He's the platform from which Barack Obama dived as commander in chief. And I say it like this because here's what happened. Over the years, the African-American has had to first show that he could fight, to prove that he could fight. Because a warrior was seen as the epitome of a man, a warrior that could think speak was an elevated man. The Greeks, they, all of their, or I shouldn't say all, most of their philosophers were also warriors. And the, the people that we held highest, Achilles, they were all students of Plato or Socrates. And so they, we started to make the warriors something special. You look at the leadership of most nations, they were warriors. All the leaders were warriors first. And then they became statesmen. So the question about the African-American was, was not just would we fight, but could we fight? And then we demonstrated our ability to fight and we proved ourselves as warriors the world over, not just in the United States, but the world over. So then the question became, could you lead? So then the non-commissioned officers, especially those non-commissioned officers that showed themselves in the first Rhode Island Regiment and then later in both the uh, Revolutionary War Civil War, and then of course, the uh, post-war with the Buffalo Soldiers, where the non-commissioned officers showed themselves and distinguished themselves in battle and showed their ability to both manage men and equipment and essentially run a unit once provided correct guidance and vision for an organization. So then the question was, well, can they plan can the African-American plan, can he really use higher level learning that we demand of our officers? And so that happened on the battlefield before West Point, but then West Point became the, West Point was the place where America's real officers were made. So, Cadet Smith first before he was denied graduation, but then ultimately the, the breakout with Henry O. Flipper. And then later Charles Young, who ascended into the ranks. And then of course, World War I broke out with the requirement to get more officers. And oh, by the way, let's see if the Negro can also lead. And so we, had tests to see if they had the aptitude of which many of us, many of our officers fly past with flying colors. Well, that was tactical leadership, not strategic leadership. So can they think broadly? That's where our general officers and the idea of a general officer comes from. And so Benjamin O. Davis shows that kind of promise himself being a West Point and having endured the, the challenges of that process. But then with the passing of executive orders in 1947 that opened up segregated forces to integration, even though a lower level scale through 
the remainder of World War II, of course, the remainder of the war, uh, the post-war era of World War II in 1945 and leading into the Korean War. We started to see some intermingling and some mixing. But the real breakout of lead, army leadership, military leadership, officers in all services began in the Vietnam War. There is where we find a young battalion commander, some battalion commanders starting to come out. And then of course, this is where we see some of our nation's leaders starting to show themselves. It was here that in the American division where young Colin Powell got a chance to show that I can lead and I can think. Wasn't a great student, but he found his niche in the United States Army. The combination of physical and mental is where he would excel. Then he would go to the Army Command and General Staff College. That place where the Army cut its leadership in half. The decision-making block where less than half will go forward, the other half will be either a trip from the Army or your mark on the world is being established. In this environment, he, he, he got what was called the white briefcase. He was the number one graduate coming out of the command, Army Command General Staff College and then went on to be recognized as a national thinker working for then many of the Republican leaders in Congress. A young man named George Bush got a chance to see his, his brilliance. And George Bush himself, being a brilliant person, recognized it. He started also looking and, and working for people where he could show that he could think. He could think much broader than the tactical confines that he had been trained in. And he started to make a mark where he recognized that he, he, had, he had been part of an army whereby when he first went to Vietnam the first time somebody said, hey, you know, we all raise our hand, we go, we go gung-ho, we fight, we do what we're supposed to do, we, we respond to the bell. But he, by the second time around, he thought it was different. And I'm not going to go into revisionist thinking because that sometimes happens, but he clearly saw that some things weren't right. He carried and stayed with him as he ascended the ranks. I was the beneficiary of some of his thinking. My first encounter with him was in 1986 when I met him as a young Brigadier General working for Casper Weinberger. But he met me on a ground that I had yet to be met by someone where he talked to me both as a soldier and with the friendliness of somebody that I had, like I had known you for all my life. And he talked to me about how it was I doing in his 101st Division, 101st Airborne Division, where he had claimed he had been a brigade commander of the 2nd Brigade, the brigade that I was actually in. And with my boss, Colonel Gene Davis, he asked me, what are we going to do? Well, at the time, without getting too much information here, he, he asked me on a straight, even kill view my opinion about how we were going to influence another nation by the action, by our tactical action. That was a wild moment. So I'm watching him ascend, but I'm also watching him lift while climbing because his questions made me feel like I was worthy. His presence let me know that was a position and a space to which I could aspire. As I watched him move up and advance and take command of the forces command, then called a joint command for the mere purposes of so of enabling him to become the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. It was here that he would showcase the nation. 
and the world is mine. His coming out party was his statesmanship in the, in the negotiation, the presentation, and the execution of his ideas and thoughts about prosecution and termination of conflict, the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, both Desert Shield and Desert Storm. And coming into the American people and talking to the American people, articulating with passion, clarity, and concern for soldiers. It was here that America saw a person of color who was a culmination of a warrior, a Vietnam vet, a soldier, a person who could, and I'll use Bloom's taxonomy, that could innovate, evaluate, and synthesize what they believed was a requirement to be a soldier and our nation's commander in chief. We saw in him as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, by the way, exercising the new rules in the Goldwater Nichols Act, leadership of the other combatant commands, the advisor, principal advisor to the president, owning the problem and his relationship with the hero of the battle being General Schwarzkopf, people started to see those pieces in a way they'd never seen before. And a person that they suddenly realized was also of color. I don't need to say that in the documentary, Love of Liberty, he appropriately became one of the first spokespersons in that documentary to talk about the love of liberty, the freedoms that we enjoy, and why people would serve often in a country whereby they were frowned upon, sometimes spat upon, often killed in the South for wearing the uniform. Even he himself was pulled over mistreated en route to Fort Benning, Georgia. But he embraced and held an ideal that was greater than any individual could stop. As many of us do, because we understand that the driver of this nation isn't individuals. It isn't the person, it is not and has not been individuals that can stop you. It is the document called the Constitution that can advance you and gives you the right to move forward. So when America saw him, and then later on, almost pushed him forward to the platform to really seriously contend in the Republican Party as a candidate for president, were it not for his wife, Alma, it is, it is my strongest belief that he would have been our first black president. But his commitment to God, family, and country was strong. And he recognized that he, as, he would sta as he would state, it is more difficult to run for president than to be president. And he loved his wife, Alma. And he did not want to take her through those slings, ambushes, that are politics because he's a patriot. He embraces this nation for all, embraced this nation for all that it could be and all that was imagined and promised in the Constitution. And when Barack Obama, someone that he declared was fully qualified, see, he used another, he used another word also. He said he meets the standard of president. He left his party to endorse a Democrat, Barack Obama. His party was a Republican. He was a declared Republican. And it makes perfect sense because he was supported by George Bush, elevated by the party to give him the authority and the rights and 
had he ran, I think he'd have been supported by that party. But when he saw the contenders that were going, and I think, and I think he would not have crossed that line if Sarah Pellin would not have been the running mate to uh, to John McCain. But when he saw the when he saw the capabilities, the reasoning, the rationale, the skills, the knowledge, abilities of Barack Obama, he felt compelled, and he used the right word the standard. There's a standard for a president. He should not have to be the best of us, but he should be from the best of us. And by all measurements, Barack Obama had met that standard of being good for this nation, reflective of this nation, reflective of his envisioned greatness. And so the platform that was established by General Colin Powell not Secretary of State Colin Powell, by the way, when he was confronted later on after having, been, after having been the Secretary of State, someone said, what should I call you, Secretary or General? He says, I'm a general. Because that's a position he'd earned, not been appointed to. That's a position that he knows he was. And so from that platform, Barack Obama became our commander in chief, but everything that he is, everything that he became was embodied in Colin Powell and he gave it to the nation. The only thing he couldn't give, uh, he could not give President Obama was service, his military service, his offering of his blood to serve this nation. And I hope that helps you understand the linkage of love of liberty. Well, thank you, General Bray. I, I want to see if Tony can uh, weigh in on these um, events that have led us up to this conversation about for love of liberty, and then obviously his reaction to the passing of Colin Powell. So, so Tony, if you could share with General Bray thoughts, reflections, and reactions to uh, to to Colin Powell. Yeah, my reaction to uh, uh, General Powell's uh, death was sadness. I mean, here was a great American, a soldier who, regardless of what party or so forth he was affiliated with, he still had a love of liberty for this country, which at the end of the day is our country. And I'm going to give it more thought that I'll call you tomorrow with because I'm still breaking up you know, driving, so I'll go through a curve and I can't hear you. So allow me to do that to give you some more thoughts, uh, Kevin, uh, when I return back to San Jose, if that's okay. That's okay. Um, we're just going to take, we're going to take what we can this, um, this session and be able to synthesize more images um, and data, but we want to make a treatment that will allow uh, us to take this fresh as we can and and be able to uh, again you know pay homage to Colin Powell on today's uh, news so um, again thank you gentlemen oh, for absolutely. yeah thank you again for for weighing yeah, in absolutely. yeah cuz i'm going to try to socialize i'm going to try to socialize as much as we can about what we're thinking feeling and and really promoting you know again what happens in the news cycle <laughs>